All right, I see uh, more people are joining us. Thanks again for coming in. Uh, live transcription is available on your screen as well. You'll see it um, either under the more button or as uh, show subtitles, or you can hide them, but that's an option uh, tonight as well for our program. All right, well, I see it is seven o'clock and we have some people still joining us, so welcome. And thanks for being here. So let's start our program tonight. So an official good evening to everyone and welcome to this fourth event in our fall series of Green in the City. This is a program in partnership with the City of London, London Environmental Network and London Public Library. My name is Joanna Kerr. I'm a librarian with the Public Library speaking to you from our beautiful downtown location in London. Our library system is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Lenapayuk, and Attawadaran peoples. The Crown Treaties in this territory are known as the Upper Canada Land Surrenders. These treaties continue to be living treaties. The First Nation communities in this region include Chippewas of the Thames First Nation, Oneida Nation of the Thames, and Muncie Delaware Nation. This land continues to be home to diverse Indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples endure in Canada, and we are grateful for the opportunity to live and to gather here. May we all recognize our own responsibility in the stewardship of this land. We invite you to read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and to reflect on acts of allyship with and actions to support Indigenous communities. The link to these calls to action is being shared in the chat for you to uh, take a look at. Acts to raise awareness and take action could also include reading books by Indigenous authors, which are included in the follow-up email after each session of Green in the City, or connecting with local Indigenous serving organizations. So thank you for reflecting on this acknowledgement and the invitation to personal action. And now I will turn things over to Deepika. Joanna. Um, so hello everyone. Um, my name is Deepika and I am from the London Environmental Network. Um, I will be the facilitator for today and we also have Kevin and Tina behind the scenes helping out if you guys want to give a wave. Um, they will also be helping out with the question and answer period at the end. Um, so yeah, we're going to get started. So this is the agenda for the evening. Our first presenter will be Dan Reinhardt, Vice President of Global Sales and Marketing at Trojan Technologies. Um, we will follow Dan's presentation with a short question and answer period um, as he will need to leave shortly after his presentation. So if you have any questions you would like to ask him when you're listening to his presentation, um, please submit them in the Q&A box below. After Dan, we will hear from Raj Gill Great Lakes Programs Director at Canadian Freshwater Alliance. After that, we'll hear from Aaron Rosenthal's Division Manager of Water Engineering at the City of London. And finally, we'll hear from Wasezi Deliri from Oneida and Chippewas of the Thames First Nations. So after all speakers have presented, we will wrap up the evening with a question and answer period. So before we begin, I wanted to mention that we are running a contest in celebration of our Fall Green in the City series. So to enter, all you need to do is choose an environmental action and post a photo or video of you doing the action on social media with the hashtag, what makes a green city? And you have a chance to win one of 15 terrific prizes at the end of the series. So some of these prizes include composters, downtown dollars, which are accepted by over 50 businesses, um, and gift certificates to various businesses, including Asmara Coffee House and Reimagine Co. And we also have many other prizes, so you won't want to miss out on this contest. Um, the deadline to enter is November 26th, and you can find full details on our website. Okay, so I wanted to remind everyone on Zoom etiquette. Um, so please submit your questions to the Q&A box at the bottom and specify which speaker you're directing it to and they will be asked during the Q&A session at the end. Also, please be respectful at all times, especially when using the Q&A box and the chat. 
Um, we want to keep it a fun, welcoming, and inclusive environment for everyone. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I will introduce our first speaker for the night, Dan Reinhardt. So Dan joined Trojan Technologies as, in 2018 as Vice President of Marketing and gained global sales responsibility in 2020. Dan provides commercial leadership and strategic direction at Trojan's global municipal, industrial, and residential sales and marketing teams. Dan holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Systems Engineering from the University of Virginia and a Master's in Business Administration from Dartmouth's Tuck School of Business. And now I'll hand it over to you, Dan. Thank you so much. And I'm thrilled to be here back in London. Uh, my third time since the pandemic started, uh, third time in the last uh, actually eight weeks. So always love making the visit here and thank you all for having me. I'm going to do, attempt to share my screen now. And there we go. So uh, just gonna take you through a handful of slides. Um, on uh, Trojan and uh, what we do. Um, we offer uh, water treatment solutions, uh, one of the leaders globally uh, in that offering. Um, and um, we have about 900 associates, uh, the majority of them here in Ontario. We put a lot of our money back into innovation so that we can continue to drive UV treatment uh, instead of uh, chlorine and other applications. Um, as you can see there, over 11,000 applications across municipalities in drinking water and wastewater. Um, and again, a global footprint. And most importantly, founded here by Hank Vanderlam uh, here in London in 1977. And since 2004, we have been part of Danaher's water quality platform. Um, ultimately, why do we care? Um, again, we strive to ensure water confidence and environmental stewardship um, across the globe through providing cost-effective, energy-efficient uh, solutions that help uh, ensure safe water uh, for consumption uh, and use across multiple industries. Where we help, basically you have 30, 37 trillion cells in your body. Um, you have 100 trillion microorganisms in your body. Uh, one to two percent of your body mass, up to 50 percent of the waste stream. The bad news, we are badly outnumbered. The good news is, is that most of these are friendly microorganisms. Our business is taking care of that 0.001 percent. Uh, and basically, we help spread uh, the, help prevent the spread of waterborne infections by, again, treating those nasty bugs that you see there on the left, cryptosporidium, uh, Giardia, et cetera. So what do we do? Uh, UV disinfection, UV photo, 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 photolysis, ozone destruction, filtration, UV oxidation, chlorine and chloramine destruction, and total organic carbon reduction. Very simple way of saying we take water molecules, which are very, very sticky, and we shine light on them, which then makes the free radicals that we don't want as part of that water fall off. So what is UV? Uh, in, when we're doing disinfection. And essentially, if you remember your Bob Barker from Price is Right many, many years ago, we spay and neuter those bugs so they can't reproduce anymore. By doing so in a physical process, we do this in, in the place of chlorine, uh, which is a toxic, and very hazardous, comes out of a drinking water wastewater is simple safe and effective. Um, again, why do people like it? Um, again, it allows you not to have to use chlorine gas as much. It allows you to into a much smaller footprint as you see there on the right. It's more effective in terms of cost and ultimately consumes less energy and produces less bad chemicals in the environment. So ultimately, we are a family of brands. Uh, up on Gore Road is our headquarters and have been here for quite some time. We also have a sister business down the road in Guelph. Um, ultimately, we're interconnected throughout the way the water supply. As, as some of you might know, there's only so much water on the planet. 
And what we try and do is try and make sure that that water is conserved and is available for use and consumption as, as best we can. Again, our typical wastewater treatment plant, and again, I'm Okay, so I think Dan is having some technical difficulties with his presentation. Um, so sorry for the inconvenience, everyone. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, so till he gets on, I think we can move on to the next speaker. Um, Dan, if he comes back, we could um, listen to his presentation after the next speaker. Um, so yeah, I'll just introduce our next speaker for the night, Raj Gill. Um, so Raj is the Great Lakes Program Director at Canadian Freshwater Alliance, and um, she has tons of experience um, in water stewardship, which is great. Um, she has over 15 years in community organizing knowledge and experience, including many years as coordinator of the Waterloo Public Interest Research Group and Community Coalition, building on a range of issues um, from cycling to advocacy to addressing Lake Erie's algal blooms. So she has also served on a number of community boards and is currently the chair of the city of Aurelia's Active Transportation Committee. So yeah, now I'll pass it over to Raj. And Deepika, I'm back, sorry. I don't know what happened there. I just lost the Oh, connection. okay. Um, Do you wanna just continue then, Dan? Yeah. If you don't mind, I, yeah. I've got yeah, like two absolutely. slides left. We like yeah. lost you for a few, like you were kind of glitching out quite a bit. So. Um, hopefully the internet connection is all good now, but blame the uh, the Delta in downtown London for not. Having <laughs> good. Can you all see my my slides again? Yes. Okay. So full screen again. Wastewater treatment um, again. Primary treatment. We are separating solids, and then we are essentially trying to take a sludge or a mixture of uh, liquid and, and and not so good stuff and get it down to pure water, and then at the end is the disinfection step where we're trying to kill the bugs that remain in said water. Uh, kill, or actually in our case, neuter. Um, again, again, what wastewater is, is breaking up, reducing the sides and removing the solids, and then finally disinfecting the bacteria to safely discharge clean water. Um, the uh, typical drinking water system, and, and a good example here, Lake Huron and Lake Erie are coming in, um, and then they need to be treated um, so that they can be consumed. And again, similar process as we talked about before. Again, you're trying to get down to clean water. Water comes in from the river. You, sit, you use coagulation and sedimentation and, set, and basically allow the gravity, which again, water treatment was invented by the Romans, basically using sand and gravity to separate uh, and get to clean water. Um, and again, ultimately, again, we sit here in this after it's basically a pure water stream uh, we disinfect it so it's safe to consume. There's still some chlorine that is dosed that is required because uh, you need to have a chlorine residual. Um, but ultimately, again, our pulling the water from the river or the lake, uh, the chlorine makes it safe. Um, again, all London wastewater is treated by our systems and we're very pleased uh, to be working with uh, the Greenway plant um, to put in a new Sigma system. To look at that system, you can see an example here Again, lights are in the water, the water flows through and it's disinfected. Again, very, very productive and, and efficient system. Um, we also support uh, the First Nations and Indigenous communities and very happy to do so. Again, have donated many systems to First Nation communities over the years. And again, uh, lots of investment back into the community. We have a series of wards that, uh, that we've made at Western uh, and again, donated many systems to help with research. Um, again, challenging times require good solutions such as ours, uh, as you can see here. And then finally, again, over 11,000 communities that we have helped. Um, we're focused on eco-efficient technologies with low total cost of ownership, small footprint, low carbon, and ultimately, again, trying to displace chlorine. And on that note, I will stop sharing and I can take questions. Am I still on?
Yes, yes, you are. Um, Apologies for the, again, I, I will uh, give the management a piece of my mind for the. You know. <laughs> um, it's fine. Yeah, it's totally fine. At least you came back, which is good. <laughs> um, so yeah, we have one question. Um, how are residuals of pharmaco pharmaco pharmacological drugs removed from waste water? So it's a really complicated question. Um, and the, the short answer is you need to have special systems that help you with those types of technology, th those types of contaminants. So like a, a Pfizer or a Merck, and actually our systems appear are in those systems. They have captive wastewater plants at their manufacturing. That stuff that came out when they were producing it. Secondarily, you know, we all consume wastewater. I mean, sorry, we all consume. Uh, did I freeze up again? Jesus Christ. Yeah, I think you're glitching a bit. Maybe try turning off your video and answering. Sometimes video takes up quite a bit of Wi Fi. I'm back again, sorry. And again, yes. the is actually then removing if there's a lot of them in the waste stream. And again, it requires specific technologies that exist. The, the ultimately where you're going to though is like forever chemicals and microparticles that exist. And frankly, we don't really treat them. We just allow them to exist because the EPA of the world have not really created regulations to do so. However, when they do, such as they are doing with PFAS or PFOS right now, which is again, the uh, silicon, uh, non-stick materials that you see in certain types of uh, cook cookware. When we start to have these types of regulations, they, we can start to treat them, but we require uh, some element of government intervention there. Hopefully that answered the question. Cool, so I'm just looking in the chat. We have some questions in the chat. Um, just scanning them through. So what is your relationship with the city of London? Um, so there's twofold. We took over an old wastewater uh, plant uh, called Westminster um, that was no longer in service. And we used that to actually test uh, and validate our systems. Um, and then um, the city of London is a um, good customer um, of ours. Uh, and we're working with them currently on upgrading um, the, the city, the system at Greenway. So again, all wastewater uh, in the city of London is treated by Trojan Technology System. Cool. So we have one more question. I think I see in the chat. Um, so why are there problems with drinking water in the Oneida community? Um, I, I, I gotta say that I, I don't know exactly what those problems are, um, but I, I do know that you know that. Uh, the stimulus bills that have been passed in both Canada and the United States are focused on providing more support for that. My guess is there hasn't been enough investment in water treatment technologies. Secondarily, particularly in, in my country from the United States, you know, unfortunately, a lot of Indigenous people have been put on places that don't have good water in the first place. And so it does require extra technology to treat and make it safe. Um, but again, I don't know. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know the details of the issues in that community today. So it would be a speculative guess to answer the question directly. But ultimately, I think, again, not enough investment in the infrastructure to treat the water on site. Secondarily, um, because unfortunately of, of, of past decisions that have been made, uh, those communities are not in the best locations and sometimes do not have access to the best water. And the, the you know, one in seven people globally does not have access to good, clean drinking water. So it is, it's, it's an issue globally because, again, we have not made the investments that we need to because global sh water should be a right. Everyone should have access to clean water. Great. Um, so uh, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I was just wondering, um, for someone who is interested in what you do in your line of work, um, what kind of advice would you give to them if they are interested? Um, definitely, you know, invest in a, a science and technology uh, education uh, is where I would, you know, go first. 
uh, environmental engineering, uh, chemical engineering are two uh, very productive degrees uh, programs, um, specifically at Western, that feed uh, people to our um, uh, our business. And then, and then, you know, ultimately, you know, Aaron will be speaking, I believe, later. Again, there are opportunities to work actually with the municipalities to help with the water treatment. Um, so again, I think start with an engineering or science and technology degree focused on biology, chemistry, engineering. Um, that's the good foundation. Uh, and then once you have that education, then you can apply it uh, and help the world be a better place. Great. Thanks so much for speaking tonight, Dan. I didn't know UV light could be used for to purify water, which is like pretty cool. Um, yeah, and it's, yeah, it's a great technology to use to, again to, to purify water or to uh, make ultra pure water, break away all the other bonds and and make the the water uh, almost pure. So again, thank you very much for having me. I apologize for the issues uh, with the uh, with the Wi-Fi. Um, uh, the some delays crossing the border uh, did not allow me to get this set up as quickly as I would have liked. It's totally okay. We understand like Wi-Fi, everyone's working at home, from home. Um, so there was bound to be some technical difficulties from time to time. But thank you so much for um, speaking tonight. Um, and yeah, uh, I will introduce our next speaker. I already did kind of a bit of an intro for Raj, um, but just for people who are joining us right now, I'll just do it again. Um, so Raj is the Great Lakes Program Director at Canadian Freshwater Alliance, and with an environmental background, Raj has over 15 years in 15 years experience in community organizing knowledge and ex other experience, including many years as coordinator of the Waterloo Public Interest Research Group and community coalition building on a range of issues, from cycling advocacy to addressing Lake Erie's algal blooms. And she has also served on a number of community boards and is currently the chair of the city of Aurelia's active transportation committee. So yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Raj. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you can see full screen or do I have to do that secret trick again? Uh, I think you have to do the secret trick again. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Here, I'll stop sharing and then we will share again. There we go. That yes, works. That looks good. Perfect. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you uh, for having me tonight. And uh, it's uh, hopefully we can move back to, to in person soon enough, but it's nice to be able to still connect virtually. Um, I'm just going to move along because uh, I know we want to get uh, to discussion and we have a few other pres presentations to go through. So uh, for those of you who don't know us, the Canadian Freshwater Alliance uh, is a national organization. We're going to be celebrating our 10th year in. Um, in 2022. And uh, we do work in London quite a bit as well, but uh, in a sense, we work uh, mostly in BC and in Ontario, and we work with residents, community groups, businesses, and First Nations uh, and governments to steward our lakes, rivers, and streams, because water is at the heart of every community, and we have a shared responsibility to nurture the next generation of water protectors and water protections. Our approach to doing this is to reconnect individuals, businesses, community groups with the river, and in this case, the, the Antler River or the Thames River, as some of you might know it, uh, and with the various lakes in the community, and uh, primarily my work is in, uh, in and around Lake Erie watershed, uh, and so that's mostly what I'll be talking about today. Uh, we also like to foster a community of stewards and advocates for the water, and we work together to develop the next generation of water protections. So when talking, when I talk about reconnecting Londoners with uh, the waterways, both Lake Erie and uh, the Thames or Antler River, here are some of the programs that we we've been uh, sort of working on over the last few years. So in 2019, pre-pandemic, we launched a series called the Explore the Thames with these various partners, uh, whose logos you see on this slide. Uh, and with that, our goal really was to uh, speak to community members who perhaps don't consider self themselves as environmentalists, who don't, uh, aren't out there by the river all the time fishing or canoeing, and introduce them to a new experience on the river, a new way to experience the river, and also learn about the river at the same time. So our audience very much was probably not any of you on this call, <laughs> hopefully some of you, uh, but really, really focused on folks who don't already consider themselves environmentalists. Uh, and the reason for this is that we really need a much broader community to care about the environment and our waterways. And so we're exploring, always exploring with the, the concept of how do we reach 
those folks who would care if they only knew a little bit more. And so this was one program we, that we launched to sort of experiment with that. Uh, and so some of the events we had, we had paddling with the pros where, uh, you know, groups um, went out onto the Thames, uh, Thames River uh, with some paddling uh, guides, but then also with Dr. Adam Yates from the university who spoke about the river, uh, river system and the ecology and the different wildlife in the river. So really doing that um, experiential learning, uh, but learning two different skills. Uh, some of the other events we did was tackling first time fishing, so out with uh, fisheries biologists, but also learning uh, about the different fish species in the river, and also the practical skills of fishing. Uh, and then finally, or one of the other events was uh, an edible and medicinal plants uh, tour with Dr. Uh, Andrew Judge. And those were just a few of the events we had uh, a whole series. Uh, and then COVID hit, and so we kind of moved to this series called the Antler River Race, which was uh, socially distanced and people could do it in their bubble. And we launched that last year, and uh, so this was our second year operating in this uh, in this format. And this really was a pivot from the Explore the Thames series to to doing something that could be done uh, in family bubbles or groups. And this was an is or an educational scavenger hunt that really focuses on highlighting local plants and animals in the watershed along the river, highlighting some of the threats and solutions and issues. Uh, so whether that be invasive species or uh, litter or you know sewage uh, pollution, really looking at the different uh, threats and some of the solutions, and then looking at different ways to sort of celebrate the celebrate the river as well. And so uh, we've had people write poems, uh, do art with some of the found objects they're finding, those kind of things. Uh, moving on to that second category, there's sort of like reconnecting folks to the waterways. And then there's the idea of really fostering a community of stewards and advocates. And two of the events I'm going to, uh, two of the ways and projects that we try to do this with, I'm going to highlight now. So this, these images are from this year's uh, Lake Erie Challenge. And this is the fourth year that we've uh, done this event. And every year we have participants from the London area, uh, athletes who get involved to do this this event. And so this year's event, uh, we had uh, stand-up paddleboarders, a wing foiler, and that's uh, Tim on the right in this screen, uh, and then a, a group of youth and um, council members from uh, Caldwell First Nation. And uh, that's the crew in the boat on the left-hand side. The Lake Erie Challenge uh, was three teams this year. Uh, they did a couple, 100 kilometers of open water uh, crossing. So Tim actually went from um, Kingsville over to Point uh, Pili Island back to Kingsville, and the other crew went from uh, went more closely along the shoreline uh, just for safety reasons. Not everyone can do the open crossing uh, right across the river, or sorry, across the lake. Uh, we had participants, uh, the neat thing about the Lake Erie Challenge is that we really try to work across different types of communities and groups. And so we had community groups, we had businesses, you see uh, the banner Pili Island Winery was involved this year, Pili Wings Nature Store, which is a, a nature store down on Point Pili uh, was involved, uh, who helped host events, who helped do fundraisers, did wine, hosted wine and, and sip events. And the point of this event really was to one bring community members together so you had community athletes working with first nations uh, um, youth and counselors working with businesses working with individuals who all care about the lake to really celebrate the lake but also to raise awareness about some of the issues that the lake is facing and a big issue for us is the algal blooms that was mentioned earlier uh, that's something that we've been working on for quite a while so this is one way that we try to sort of have fun but also raise awareness and education and fun for, for the cause. The second piece is the Lake Erie Guardians, and this is another program I wanted to hire. Uh, this is a program we've been running for a few years, but we really amped it up this year working uh, in collaboration with the Water Rangers. And so we had 50 Lake Erie Guardians across the watershed, including London, uh, who were learning how to do water testing. So these are some of, some of the folks out in the watershed doing water testing this year. Uh, and they were doing a few things. They were doing water testing, but they've also been working on restoration efforts. And so the photo on the uh, left-hand side is a planting we did at a stormwater pond in London uh, at the beginning of October uh, and we worked with Reforest London on that and then the second image uh, is from a wetland restoration project that we 
worked with with the Essex Region Conservation Authority down in Leamington. So just a sampling of some of the uh, kinds of activities that they've been involved in. Uh, and then finally, uh, I mentioned the business involvement. I really, really just touched on it, but uh, we've started working with a group in, your, uh, in the States called the Great Lakes Business Network and slowly building up participants and businesses in Canada who are involved in that as well to become advocates for, for Lake Erie and speak up about Lake Erie and Pili Island Winery, uh, uh, Pili Wings Nature Store, or just a couple of the businesses that have joined the network this year. Uh, and again, are standing up and, and sort of speaking out about the Great Lakes and its value to, um, to our communities. And then finally, um, the advocacy piece, I don't wanna uh, miss the opportunity to sort of talk about, you know, but there's sort of the individual actions we can kind of take, but then there's that, sex, that, that piece that really needs uh, something bigger, needs bigger community action to sort of get involved in. And that's where we really do try to foster advocates to speak up again, uh, up for the rivers, for the lakes. Uh, the Great Lakes Business Network is one way to do that. Um, but then, you know, as Dan was saying earlier, if you want to start dealing with um, PFAS or some of the pharmaceuticals in our water really do need government regulation to kind of say, okay, no, this is not acceptable. There needs to be, you know, higher standards to do this. That's how we essentially dealt with the algal blooms in the 1970s when Lake Erie was declared uh, dead because the blooms and pollution in the lake were so bad. And the Canadian and U.S. governments actually passed <laughs> legislations and informed the Great Lakes Water Quality Act that uh, put some teeth and regulations to how our wastewater was treated, to what kind of pollution uh, could, you know, needed to stop being dumped into, into the, the lake system untreated. And that really made a big, uh, a big difference and, and resolved a lot of issues. And so that's always the final point I wanna end off on is, is sort of there's that individual action, but then also building the momentum and the capacity to speak to our elected officials, to speak at town halls, to meet with uh, MPPs, to get involved in community consultations when there are opportunities to do that as well. And uh, that's where I'll leave it. Great. Thanks so much. Um, it's just so cool to see how active Canadian Freshwater Alliance is. And there's just so many opportunities for people to get involved. And I love how, like, you just, like, explained everything. So it was great just to hear about and to become more aware about. So, yeah, thank you so much for presenting tonight. If you have any questions for Raj, please submit them in the Q&A box below and they will be asked during the Q&A session at the end, um, which you won't want to miss. So yeah, thank you so much for presenting. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker for the night, Erin Rosenthals. So Erin is the division manager of water engineering at the city of London, and he's responsible for water conservation initiatives, drinking water education and outreach, managing new and existing drinking water infrastructure and water billing. So Erin is a professional engineer who has been in this role for four years and has been with the city for 14 years. Um, so yeah, I'll pass it over to Erin to start his presentation. Thanks. I'll uh, share my screen now. All right. All right. Hello, everybody. So, uh, yeah, I'm water, uh, Aaron Rosenthal, is manager of water engineering at the city, and I'm here to talk about our efforts on uh, water stewardship. And uh, I'll just kind of give a caveat that, you know, my, my focus will more be on kind of what we're doing on the drinking water side. Um, there's lots of other great stuff uh, my colleagues are doing as well. Um, so let's get started. Uh, I think so the first thing I wanted to talk about was the blue communities, because this was a really big thing for us. And uh, earlier this year, London officially became a blue community, which is a program put on by the Council of Canadians. Um, there's three steps to becoming a blue community. You must declare water and sanitary servicing as a human right, ban or phase out bottled water sales and support a public water and wastewater system. Um, so, and I think before I get it, so now I'm going to go into the details of each of these and how we uh, satisfy them. And I would like to take a moment to kind of uh, um, recognize the, the local chapter of the Council of Canadians for their good work they've done, they did on this kind of being patient, working with me, working with the city to 
um, discuss our concerns and to be uh, you know, very, very good to work with. So here is a council resolution. Provision of water is a human right and water will be provided to all residents despite their ability to pay for the service. And this is what often scares a lot of people at, uh, in my position um, from Blue uh, community. But uh, you know, when we looked into it more, we were already doing a lot of the things uh, that we need to do to, to, to meet this. So the first is we do provide funding uh, to the Salvation uh, Center of Hope to give crisis support uh, to people who are having trouble paying their water bill. So we actually do fund that from our uh, from our water system. Um, and then another piece is we have payment plans through London Hydro. And this is a, you know, a bit less, but is an important piece for uh, kind of catching people that are that are in between that maybe don't qualify for the Salvation Army help, but do also still need help, maybe had a temporary uh, financial issue or something like that. <clears throat> And, but we don't kind of stop there as well. We do uh, aim to prevent people from getting to that place. Uh, the biggest one for that is the, our leak allowance program. So we have a program where if you've had a big leak uh, resulting in a large bill, um, you, can, you can come to us um, and, you know, and, and there's a whole form to fill it and everything. And then you can actually get what would be your normal average bill. So essentially we waive that leaked amount. And this is a really important piece for kind of, that's one way people end up having trouble with their bills. Um, and uh, we also can uh, have customer water efficiency audits. Uh, I'll talk about a bit more later as well, but uh, where we go into people's home and just basically study their water use, make recommendations. Um, this device here uh, is called a Flowey on the right. And it actually will give instantaneous readings from a water meter that you can get on your cell phone or on a computer. Um, and we really use that to kind of do these audits and also to troubleshoot people's leaks. So that's the other thing. We sometimes get a call from people that their water bill has gone up. And they don't know why. And so we will kind of work with them to actually see where the problem is. And, you know, it's often a leak. Um, and, and it's great that we can fix those and then, um, and then kind of not have that wasted water. Uh, so the other big piece, and this is kind of more of the environmental aim of this, is that uh, the sale of bottled water uh, will, and we were able to put in a resolution, will continue to be a restrict in the city of London facilities. This is something you know we're proud of that we were a leader in this and is now a lot of places have followed us that we have banned bottled water for more than a decade. Um, but has, you know, the kind of naysayers at this point out you know, just banning bottles isn't enough. Um, you know, it can, you know, if there aren't any other options, um, you know, there's still sugary drinks in those vending machines and, uh, and children might have that instead. So we've really taken a focus on convenience and availability. Uh, here's some of our, uh, here's some of what we, you may have seen these at the, uh, the festivals, the big thirst mobile here at the larger festivals are these little thirst stations here with the nice cartoons that we bring out to smaller events. Uh, to really get, you know, you know, get people drinking tap water, get it out there and to make it available. Um, so people, you know, it is convenient and they don't, uh, you know, kind of takes away some of that convenience of that. We also do this inside. Um, so we've been doing this in city water facilities, uh, replacing old, worn out uh, fountains. We've been partnered with our facility group to do this. Um, and also some efficiencies while we're at it, uh, looking at the water usage and as well, uh, you know, we've introduced waterless urinals that have actually worked out pretty well and those don't always work out so well in uh, some of our facilities. And then the final piece I won't spend too much time on was that uh, we have to keep our systems public. And I think this is really big and important uh, for ensuring equity in the system and, uh, and you know, keeping, keeping it uh, accessible to people. But our system is public, always has been, and there's no uh, plans to change that. I know we didn't really talk about changing it. So now that I've gone through that, I wanna try to talk about some of the other stuff we've been doing. So one of, the th one of our great, uh, one of our really uh, nice things we've done this year is we embarked on doing some auditing and retrofits at our, our, some of our social housing partners. Um, and this was something we've, this was for the first time uh, that we've done this is we worked with them to and helped fund uh, hiring some uh, consultants 
to examine energy and water use at a bunch of these social housing facilities uh, buildings and uh, and then actually come to recommendations and there was really some really good water savings uh, in part of this uh, you know uh, you, you, some of these things uh, you find in these places are, are, are challenging like you know I you know one of the stories from this is they found some refrigeration unit that was supposed to be using a bit of cooled water to uh, help its uh, help keep things cold but it was broken and it was just running through so it was essentially like a tap full blown for 24 seven. Um, so, so this was a really great initiative that uh, I think, you know, and we really had our three aims here, lowering the bills for our housing partners, which does help, you know, our greater mission, making housing more affordable, um, include and improving the climate resiliency. And, uh, and yeah, so that's uh, some of our aims there. Another uh, project that we, we haven't accomplished yet, but we're really, focused on this and, and looking to get it off the ground is re water reuse. Um, this is something that would be new for London and isn't all that common in Ontario, uh, but uh, we have been looking at using waste, you know, using the uh, treated wastewater to irrigate sports fields. So this is something we've been working with our parks group and our wastewater treatment folks to see, you know, and really kind of getting into the regulations of treatment. It is a bit of a difficult thing because it is kind of, uh, you know, newer for this region. Um, but we're hoping that we can, uh, we can make it a success and then bring that uh, elsewhere. Because yeah, really like a lot of this is, you know, just the, just the fact that we have to, currently our water gets piped into Lake Huron that comes to these fields right here. Um, it's treated water. Uh, and, and there's a lot of energy cost to bringing it there at pressure. Whereas we are treating water and then sending it into the river literally right beside it. Um, so this is something we saw as a good opportunity, probably the low hanging fruit in this water reuse. And so we're hoping uh, to make it a success. Um, another thing we've been working internally as well is, is, is to encourage blue roofs. So we've been working with our facilities group again uh, to have some feasibility for turning some flat roofs that are towards the end of their life into actually a blue roof, which uh, is a roof that is designed to store some amount of stormwater um, to kind of lessen the impacts on the systems downstream. And we, you know, we do see if we can show this works uh, going forward, getting into partnerships with private property owners, um, and, and getting more extensive. Uh, so yeah, for, so for some of these things, you know, we kind of start working internally because that's, you know, where we have some easier time kind of uh, logistically and legally. Uh, and then, you know, and then once we're able to show success there, we have more success bringing it to the broader community. Um, and as well, we have been working with Len. I would be <laughs> remiss if I didn't mention that at this event uh, with Len and in, in industry. So we have been kind of co-funding some water efficiency audits and refits um, and as well encouraging LID implementations on private property. Um, this is kind of a, a nice one. So we, so the way our rate structure works is, is if you have a large piece of property like like this one, and you essentially go above and beyond stormwater wise um, in terms of treating your stormwater, in terms of infiltrating your stormwater um, and low impact development features, then you can actually get a discount on the rate you pay for the stormwater charge on your bill, which is given a powerful incentive for some of these companies and larger landowners to, uh, to step that up. And then, if, and then, of course, we do do some outreach and education because we do think it's important to um, be spreading the word of the importance of water stewardship to the next generation. So we do we have a strong partnership with Storybook Gardens. Uh, we have uh, been working with them for years on programming, on designing the gardens. Uh, Nobert's garden, I think it's being retired soon, was uh, was something we partnered with them on um, to try to show some kind of lower water use landscaping. And as well, we are in schools. You can see a nice uh, pre-pandemic picture here, obviously, of one of our staff members um, in a school helping uh, children understand how our water system works 
and how why that water that comes out of the tap is valuable and that's really uh you know an important piece to get to across to children because you know for them it's very easy to just see they just turn on the tap and water comes out whenever they want so they don't really see that as something valuable so you really have to make that connection what it takes for that water to get there i thought i'd uh, cap this off with a bit of kind of what what you can do in your personal life uh so uh if you email this email here water at london.ca you can request a water audit of your of your home and we'll our staff will work with you to uh come out at a time um, we do these year round, but we really promote it in the summer because we can handle higher volumes of them in the summer. Um, and, uh, but yeah, but you can just email them and request that and they'll do that. Uh, we also have best practices for sewers. We have YouTube videos on our website. Um, and, and yeah, definitely periodically check for leaks in your home, especially the toilets, because it's usually the toilets. Somebody deals with this stuff all the time. That's usually the one that leaks and you have a, it's a really hard to notice a toilet leak. Um, so if you take away anything from my presentation, I'd say this picture of your meter, there's this little piece in the middle called the low flow regulator. And this is probably the easiest way to make sure there's no leaks in your house is make sure you got all your taps and everything turned off and then just go to look at your meter and is that thing spinning? And if it is, then and you have everything off, then you got a leak. And, it's about trying to find where it is um so yeah hopefully hopefully you can check your water meter tonight or tomorrow and uh and maybe prevent a leak or stop a leak so with that i just say thank you and i wanted to especially kind of give credit to my water demand team uh that works with me there within water engineering daniel shaw jennifer levitt and christine jansen um, i'm here presenting but they're the ones that are really uh doing all this great stuff out there that's all. Great presentation, Erin. Thank you so much for presenting tonight. Um, it was really interesting just to hear what the city is actually doing in terms of um, protecting London's water resources and what you'll be doing going forward as well. And also the use of blue roofs, which is really cool to hear and hopefully having that become more common. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for presenting tonight. If you have any questions for Erin, be sure to submit them in the Q&A box below. So with that, I will introduce our final speaker for the night, Wasezi Deliri. So Wasezi is an Anishinaabekwe from Oneida Nation of the Thames and Chippewa of the Thames First Nations. Wasezi is Medewalan and a member of the Three Fires Medewalan Lodge. She is Loon Clan and is a mother and grandmother. She has been advocating for water and teaching about Anishinaabe culture for over 35 years. So with that, I will pass it over to Wasezi. Bojo, Wasiasage Kwe and Dijna Kaz De Mong and Dodem, Mede Wana Kwe and Dao and Ishnabe Kwe and Dao Niso Medewid, Nui Jaganashi Majina. So I'm just going to, um, I just introduced myself um, and I do have a PowerPoint that I'll share with you as well. I just wanted to um, say thank you, Miigwech, for um, inviting me to share with you. Um, <clears throat> so I introduced myself and that just lets everyone know um, where I'm from. Um, and I say what my spirit name is, um, the clan family that I belong to, which is the Loon, um, and that I am Midday Women. And that helps to allow people to, um, to know me, to know my family, um, my lineage, and, and just where I'm from. <clears throat> a, a big part of who we are as Anishinaabe people or Haudenosaunee people has a lot to do with who our families are and where we come from. Um, there's always an acknowledgement of our ancestors that have gone on before us um, because those lineages we believe um, we're still connected to them, to those lines, to our ancestors. And it is from them that we gain the knowledge um, and understanding of who we are. So in the in the picture here, you'll see my great grandparents, um, Jojo and Dada. Um, and the little girl in the corner is my mother and she was raised by her grandparents. And then on the other side, you'll see um, a piece of Otome artwork 
And um, on my father's side, my grandmother was from Mexico. They're indigenous from Mexico and they're Otome. And they still, what's really cool is that even to this day, they still retain their traditional, like their cultural ways and their language. So I always like to share that. Um, this is a picture of my clan, which is the Loon clan. It's one of the seven clans of the um, Ojibwe or Anishinaabe people. And my clan in particular is, um, is a water clan. Um, and it's one of the chief clans of the, of the Anishinaabe clan system. And the clan system is a way to, for our societies or for our nations to organize themselves. And in my introduction, I also talked about, and I shared um, that I belong to the Three Fires Medewin Lodge and that I am Medewin. And, um, and so the understanding that I have and that I'm gonna share tonight comes from there and the teachings um, and understanding about water. And one of our teachers um, who has sat, since passed on, um, there's, a, there's an image of him there. And um, I've always been taught that you're supposed to acknowledge the knowledge that you have and where it comes from. So it's not um, the understanding and what I'm gonna share tonight um, comes from somewhere. And so it's important that we always acknowledge where that comes from. And so the teachings that I'm sharing and some of the understanding that I'm sharing, sharing this evening um, came from his mother and his grandmothers and, and all the way back to the beginning. Um, and so that's, it's always important to do that. In our, um, in our understanding of life, our creation story is the one story that um, helps us to understand life. And so even in our understanding about water and how we think about water, our relationship with water, all goes right back to the very beginning to the, to the creation story when creation happened. And it's a really long, beautiful story. And um, I've often heard it said that it would take up to seven days for it to be told in its entirety. And that it would not be one person that would tell it, but they would, they would take turns to, to share it. And um, I've had the privilege to hear it a number of times, not in seven days, um, but um, so our understanding of water and how we're supposed to be, um, how we're supposed to take care of that, how we're supposed to have a relationship with it, it all stems from the creation story. And in that story, um, there's a point in time where in the story, the creator eventually hands over the responsibility of creation to a woman. And so in an Anishinaabe culture and understanding it is woman's um, responsibility, prime responsibility to take care of life, take care of life and to take care of the water because the water is what allows us to have life. It's not only woman's responsibility, but it's her main responsibility. She's the one first that stands up for the water. And, and, so, um, and so when I'm sharing here this evening, that's part of the work that I do as a Anishinaabe, I'm kind of fulfilling part of that role. And so when the creator created all of creation, um, you'll see a medicine wheel here. And in this particular medicine wheel, um, you'll see the, the title spiritual, mental, physical, and emotional. And we know in our creation story that even when the creator created um, the first human beings, that they were given four parts of self so that um, they were giving a spiritual self, they were given a mental self, a physical self, and an emotional self. And together, all those four components made up that whole person. And the same is true for all of life, that the universe was given all of those four components. And that's what brings balance, harmony and wholeness to the universe. And it brings that to ourselves as human beings. And so whenever it is that we talk about water or we're thinking about how can we help the water? What do we, what can we do? That it's important that we remember that the water is not just a physical being, that we know it's not just a physical being, 
that the water has a spirit and her spirit needs help also. And so a lot of the work that I do um, focuses around that, about helping her spirit. And, <clears throat> and we do that through a lot of different ways. The ways that we connect spiritually is through prayer and song and ceremony. Um, and you'll see a, a picture of uh, a copper vessel here. And in our ceremonies, that's what we use to, to pray for the water with and to carry the water. <clears throat> this is my grandmother, my mother's mother. And you'll see in this picture that she has um, like a sash on and a belt. And she also has a headband on. And in our ceremonial ways, we have different societies that take care of different things. Um, and these societies do that responsibility of whatever that work is, kind of like how City Hall has different components of it to make sure that the city runs properly. Well, we have that in our own ways as well, ceremonially. And so <clears throat> this sash and this belt and this headband that my grandmother wears, um, when people see her wearing that, and when the spirit sees her wearing that, when creation sees her wearing that, they know that part of her work and responsibility in life is to stand up for the water, to take care of the water. Um, and so that's part of her work at ceremonies, but also in life in general. And so the way that we pass on our knowledge and understanding to make sure that it continues is there's like lines of knowledge transmission. And so what we would call them in English is something like water lines. And so my grandmother, my mother, myself, my daughter, and now my granddaughters are one water line. And within that water line, there's five generations living present on the earth right now. And so, the responsibility that each one of us has in those lines is to make sure that the understanding of the water, the teachings, the songs, the ceremonies, that those all get passed on. So uh, my grandmother teaches it to my mother, my mother teaches it to me, I teach it to my daughter, my daughter teaches it to my granddaughter. And so that's how we make sure that that understanding and that knowledge um, is transferred. And so I also do this work. I have um, a belt. My mother has a sash and a belt. Um, and my daughter, you'll see there's copper thimbles on the sash and the belt. And those represent the copper vessels that we use to pray for the water with. Um, I don't have a sash yet. Um, and my daughter has a thimble. So she wears a necklace with just a thimble on it. And my granddaughter, who was just born, um, two, almost two years ago now, she has, she will have a thimble as well. Um, and so that's some of the work that I do in terms of ceremonies. Uh, ceremonially, that's one of my responsibilities is to, to stand up for the water, to advocate for the water, um, and to make sure that I pass that on to my daughter, all of the knowledge that my grandmother and mother carry and myself and I pass it on to my daughter and my granddaughter. So eventually when we are not here um, living on this earth that there will still be somebody who remembers that and who will continue that work into the future. Thanks Susie. Just, um, yeah. We have about two minutes left. Okay and these are just pictures of my granddaughters. Um, the one is at ceremonies you see by the Lake and Perry Island. And then the other one is for Orange Shirt Day on the walk. Um, it's just pictures now anyways. These are pictures of us, uh, myself and my family at ceremonies that we attend every year. This is in the spring. This is a water bundle offering uh, that we do in the winter time. We always do a huge ceremony before ceremonies begin. Um, first off to give thanksgiving to the water because we believe that the water again like I said is not just a physical entity entity but a spiritual one and so the water also helps to 
um, move life forward in a good way spiritually as well. And so the first thing we do before we start ceremonies or any kind of gathering is to honor the water. Um, and we do that at, at a body of water. Right now we're on the, um, the Snide River in Walpool Island, the small river. So it's frozen right now, so we're on top of it. And then we also acknowledge and give thanksgiving for the water every day. So in the morning at sunrise, we offer our tobacco and give thanksgiving for new life and for the water. Um, and then this is a picture I took um, over by Milton, I believe. And so whenever I come to a body of water, river, lake, stream, waterfall, um, I always offer my a same on. That's one of the things that we use tobacco um, to give thanksgiving to the water and to, to say thank you to her for, for giving us life. Some more pictures, one of um, at Agua Falls and on the north side of Lake Superior. This one is, uh, this one picture on the left is of um, one of the streams that flows into the river here in London, over by the Agricultural Museum, back behind there somewhere, I'm always hiking around. Um, and then the other one is in, again, Walpool Island in the marshes. These are some pictures from Fanshawe Park Conservation Area um, and from up by French River. Ways that we, part of my, part of the work I do as a mother, but also my, in understanding that it's important to have a connection to creation and to the water around us. And ways that we do that is to spend time on the land. Um, and so making sure that my children and nieces and nephews have those opportunities. So there's us fishing on the Thames River. Thanks, so Sophie. Um, yeah. um, so sorry, but it, this was a beautiful presentation. Thank you so much for presenting tonight. Unfortunately, we have, um, we're running out of time okay. for the Q&A session, but thank you so much for presenting tonight. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah. So with that, I will ask Tina and Kevin to start asking questions from the Q&A box. So I'll pass it over to Kevin. Thank you, Deepika. Okay, um, I'm going to get started with the first questions in our Q&A box here. And um, this question is for Raj. Uh, how does one get involved in the Lake Erie Challenge? Mm -hmm. Oh, so many different ways to get involved. So uh, I think I just briefly touched on, on you know, what the, the challenge is. And, uh, you know, every year it's been a little bit different. So really the, the concept behind it was that there were, I was working with a, a group of recreational swimmers and uh, they kind of said, okay, well, we want to advocate for the lake. And what we know how to do is to swim. And so how can we work together to use swimming as a way to raise awareness and excitement about the about the lake and the watershed, but also to help protect it. And so that's where it sort of began. So first year it was four swimmers who, who did a 24 hour swim challenge at 10 different locations in the lake. The second year it was a, a swimmer who did 30, uh, 30 kilometer swim as well as a group of stand up paddle boarders. Uh, the third year it was kayakers, paddle boarders and swimmers. And then this year is wing foilers and stand up paddle boarders. So really trying to like cover all the different sports. And it really just depends on what your interest is. If you're interested as a, as a, as an athlete in doing some kind of endurance or, or challenge type of uh, activity, usually that's where I start is, is starting to have those conversations with folks who are interested in, and we build teams around that uh, to, to take the challenge itself. But then, um, as I said, it's so multifaceted. So the businesses are involved in different ways uh, in terms of doing fundraising activity activities in terms of writing educational blog posts and social media posts and doing media interviews about why they care about about the the lake and, and the water system and really like the Thames River is one of the major rivers that runs into Lake Erie so you're really in the Lake Erie watershed uh, your core part 
out on the Thames River, you know, a core part of the of the system, uh, and everything that happens really upstream in, in the Grand River or or the Thames River ends up in in the lake eventually and impacting what's happening in the lake. So that's why I'm, I, I talk about Lake Erie, but I'm really talking about the whole watershed and, and what's happening in the watershed. But um, but yeah, going back to that, really, it's like if you're interested in an athlete. Uh, you know, definitely get in touch. Um, if you're interested in his business in, in terms of getting involved, then that's another opportunity. We've had musicians come out who said, you know, this is great. And, and pre, pre COVID had uh, musicians sort of uh, participate in the shore activities on beach activities and, and play music. Um, there was a group of community groups um, and businesses on Pili Island this year that wanted to get involved. And so when Tim and the wing foilers made it onto the island, they um, they hosted lunch for them. They hosted shoreline cleanups. They did some uh, eco art activities. Uh, and so really just, you know, let's talk is what I would say in my, in my email is raj at freshwateralliance.ca. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Tina, I'm gonna pass it over to you for the next question. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. So this next question is for Aaron. So would it be possible for you to give more information on how the blue roofs work? Yeah, sure. So essentially, like they can be set up in a number of different ways, but essentially it's a, a roof that is meant to capture storm water. So, um, you know, it doesn't work on, say, your typical house, like sloped roof. This is for flat roofs. So typically you got a flat roof and then there's like little, uh, you know, it's almost made like a pool already. And so what you have to do is you have to, you know, very well waterproof it, of course. Um, and, then, and then the way you control it is you have just, you limit the flow that can come out uh, down the downspouts for that uh, roof and then you have a higher outlet that has more flow so basically you allow it when it rains a lot that the roof can fill up and then when it gets to the top there's another to spill it off so it doesn't just spill all over the place so that's the base way it works but yeah when you get into the weeds of each roof and how they would do it, it yeah there's a lot of different ways okay great thank you i'm gonna pass on the next question to be asked by kevin okay thanks <laughs> Okay, um, we have a question for Wasasi. Um, and our question is, thank you for your presentation. Uh, if you are comfortable sharing, how has your relationship with water changed over time or seasons? Bonjour. Um, I think that, I guess as anybody ages and with more life experience and especially becoming a grandmother, um, I think my understanding about the water in terms of um, the importance of spiritually taking care of it has changed and it's become more critical. Um, in one of the slides that I didn't get to show, um, I do a lot of, um, I'm on the land quite a bit and we were up in my mother's community and we pick berries. And so we were out by a river um, fishing and there was a strawberry plant in bloom and I was excited because it was spring, it was kind of early, but it's like, oh cool, a strawberry plant is in bloom. But then right beside it, there was a blueberry bush and it had blueberries on it. And if you know anything about berries in their natural seasons, they don't grow together. Those two berries grow in very di different seasons. And so to me, that's, there's something wrong, there's something going on in our environment. And so I guess now that I'm of a certain age, I guess the, the it's critical to me that we do something about the water, that there's a more urgency in the work that I do and making sure that I pass on the knowledge to my daughter and granddaughters and to anybody else. And so that's why um, whenever I get asked, I do take the opportunity to speak at events like this. Thank you very much. Amazing, thank you. And it was really great to hear your, um, your experience and your relationship with water. Um, we have time for one more question, so I'm going to pass it off to Dina to ask us the last question of the evening. Thanks, Kevin. So this last question is another one for Aaron. So when and how will water bottles be phased out? 
So maybe I wasn't uh, super uh, as clear as I could have been. So it's it's only in city facilities that they're being phased out. So um, or that they already are phased out. Uh, they've been banned for yeah, I think it was two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Um, so yeah, but that is just city facilities. So that's like your arenas, community centers, um, places like that. Uh, doesn't apply to kind of private places. Okay, thank you. So I think that concludes our Q&A period. So I will pass it on over to Deepika. Thanks, Tina and Kevin for asking all those questions. I see that we have a bunch of questions. So in the follow-up email, um, we'll try to get those answered. So don't worry about that. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly once again. <clears throat> Okay, so just a reminder to enter our Green in the City contest um, by November 26th for a chance to win one of 15 terrific prizes at the end of the series. You can find all details on our website um, and it will also be included in the follow-up email as well. So the email will also include a reading list of related books and eBooks related to tonight's theme. So you don't want to miss out on that. Um, also, we only have two more sessions left in our fall Green in the City series. So next week's event will focus on some amazing examples of sustainable buildings and retrofits within London um, that are leading the way to a greener future. So if you'd like to check that out, be sure to register for that event on our website. And we also have a feedback form for the series at the following link. It's really long, so we're gonna put it in the chat um, and it'll also be included in the follow-up email. So this will be just really useful for us to know how we can improve these events going forward. And it only takes a couple of minutes to do. So if you have the time, I highly encourage you to do it. And if you would like to stay up to date with us on upcoming events like this, um, volunteer opportunities and so on, be sure to sign up for our e-newsletter on our website. And once again, we're super excited to be collaborating with the London Public Library and City of London in organizing these Green in the City sessions. So thank you so much for coming. And finally, I just want to say thank you to all of our amazing speakers for tonight. We had a lot of diverse perspectives regarding water and water stewardship. Um, I'd also like to thank our supporters and thank you to all of you, the attendees, for coming out tonight and for all your amazing questions um, and learning about and wanting to learn about some great environmental initiatives right here in London and how you can get involved. Um, so yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed tonight's Green in the City session and thank you so much.